Hello, everybody. I am Toby Delbrook from University of Zurich and ETH Zurich, and together with my main co-editor, Walter Leon Salas from Purdue University, and our other co-editors, Bernabe and Teresa from IMSE in Sevilla, I welcome you to our confession session, Lessons Learned the Hard Way. This is a paper that you can read. It has 29 authors, and I encourage you to look at it and especially get your students to look at it. Uh, but the question is, why a special confession session in the Circuit and Systems Symposium? Well, the basic point is that papers leave out failures and troubleshooting pains that the authors went through until they succeeded. The implicit assumption is that unsuccessful efforts don't move the field forward and so are not worth sharing. But mistakes and failures are an integral part of learning to do research. We hope that the publications, the mistakes, failures, and the solutions will help other researchers avoid costly mistakes. We had previous confession sessions. In fact, the entire series of confession sessions was uh, spawned by my father's group meetings at Caltech, which were called confession sessions, where people were expected to come and report all their failures. And especially by Jed Hurwitz, my good friend Jed Hurwitz, who did the first, uh, in 2009, Jed Hurwitz organized a live ISCC, ISSCC forum called For Forewarned is Forearmed, Classic Analog Mistakes and this was misspelled, to avoid. Confessors uploaded their confessions to a website and each confessor was allotted a few minutes and one slide to explain what went wrong in their analog designs. Unfortunately, there's no record of these confessions. Then in 2011, inspired by Jet's forum, Bernabe and I organized the first ISCAS confession session in Rio de Janeiro, very appropriate with the, uh, the big Catholic you know, monument standing over the town. Um, to confess your sins there. Anyway, we 25 confessions were contributed by entirely by members of the Sensory Systems Technical Committee, and the paper and the slides are still available. You can look at our, our new paper to find um, this previous paper and actually the confession slides and the winner of the best confession. In 2019, we finally decided to go for it. The great uh, um, Century Systems Technical Committee comes through again with almost all of the 29 new confessions. So we hope you enjoy these. We have now organized these into the following categories. There are three troubleshooting pains, 12 two analog goose, five logic design errors, four layout versus schematic goose, two process design oversights, five not accounting for or understanding parasitics, and a major category is eight planning errors. Uh, the paper also includes a checklist that we'll show at the end of this presentation that might help to catch some of these types of errors. So with this, we'll pass it straight over to the confessions in numerical order. Enjoy. Now this presentation includes the confessions that are colored blue. But see our paper for all the confessions, including the black ones here that we didn't manage to extract from our co-authors. Hi everybody, Toby Dalbrook here. In our case, in confession number one, two problems masked each other. We were developing this null hub um, robot demonstrator of our FPGA accelerator. And um, our null hub FPGA CNN accelerator would not run stably. We were on a deadline for NIPS demo and we were all yelling at each other because it wouldn't work. The solution was we finally traced down the problem to two intermittent bugs. First of all, a crappy power supply for the delicate FPGA logic would cause the logic to just stall intermittently. We, the solution was to get a stronger power supply. Secondly, spaghetti. there was a spaghetti logic bug that would hang with a row of zero pixels which we would get from real data. And the solution was we stuffed the pixels in software to avoid zero rules. So if there are any morals from this, they are that there might be multiple reasons for the same symptom. And when you're using FPGAs, talk to your supplier. And thirdly, and last, a real world test bench beats pre-can single tests because all the tests passed in the pre-can thing and when we expose it to real data, we got these rows of zero pixels. One of our projects in the lab needed a large experimental test bed where we required more power outlets than the available on a single workbench. 
Hence, we needed to spread up over two workbenches. In three consecutive incidents, we tried to connect devices on one workbench to the devices on the other workbench using a USB cable. In each incident, we experienced a massive spark that fried our expensive equipment. After an investigation, we figured out that the ground connection on one workbench was actually a live wire that produced a huge voltage difference between the grounds of the workbenches. Through these incidents, we learned that always use a DMM to check your power outlets and don't assume your live infrastructure is fault free. And it is always a better option to use a single power supply for the whole of your project prototype. In 2017, we designed a low power SOC with a total power budget of around 10 microamp. To measure the block level power consumption precisely, we did not include the large ESD devices on the pad, and the PMOS switch is added before each block. However, during testing, the chip cannot be powered up, and the measured power consumption is more than 10 milliamp, which is much higher than expected. We will review the layout again and find one potential issue in the switch design. Because the switch size is small and we put very dense contact in the layout at the top level, the substrate resistance is low. If there is an ESD event from the ground to the supply, the surge current will be large enough to break down the parasitic diode in a small switch. To solve this issue, we tape out this design again by removing all the switches and added more pads for power measurement. A lot of money was wasted due to this small error. The moral from this design is never underestimate the importance of understanding the parasitic influence on your circuit, even for a simple switch. At the beginning of my PhD, I was simulating the leakage current in a um, the PMOS transistor used as a pseudo resistor like here and I was seeing some strange results. So the SPI simulation showed that the, trans the transistor leakage current changed linearly with drain source voltage instead of exponentially as expected. And it turns out this was caused by this SPI parameter called Gmin which by default is 1 to the minus 12 and this adds a 1 picosiemens linear conductance between the source and the drain, therefore this linear behavior is in here. By changing this g mean to a, a very low conductance, um, this problem is solved. And so for a g mean of 1 to the minus 30, we now see a, an exponential behavior in, in, uh, in the drain source current versus uh, drain source voltage. And the morale for this uh, is that you need to, to understand the simulation configuration before running simulations and if you want the correct results, you should use correct configurations. We had designed the first version of a fully digital convolutional chip with 32 by 32 pixels and it worked great. Then, we designed an improved version with much more compact 64x64 64 64 pixels and new functionalities. When testing this new chip, we observed some nasty vertical lines in output images. After checking everything for several days, we found out that one bit in a control bus going from the control block to the left-right shifter was not connected, either in the layout or in the high-level schematic. This mistake was never detected in high-level behavioral simulations as it only produced errors for some specific input events. The morals are, when it is not possible to do full chip transistor-level simulations, you have to be very careful with your high-level descriptions and try to verify them exhaustively, covering any possible situation that can happen. This confession is about late clock data recovery reset due to excessive delay. So in, in this work, we were designing a, a serial high-speed address event communication scheme between two chips. We had an, a transmitter chip and a receiver chip. We had a low voltage differential signaling a pair of high-speed wires uh, together with sun checking signals. High-speed signals were transferred to using a very high speed uh, LVDS and bulky drivers. 
that could communicate data at gigabit per second speed. On the other hand, lower speed signals, the handshaking signals, they did not need such a high speed. For them, we used normal uh, digital uh, paths that will go full swing. Uh, however, standard paths would introduce extra delay, as we found out later, because of uh, of chip parasitics between the chips, the PCB traces, and the package itself. So this was introducing a, a delay in the handshaking signals that would produce the loss of the first two bits in the in the high speed link. In, in order to find out what happened, what we did was resimulate the extracted a, uh, layout with all the parasitics from the PCB traces and from the packages that allowed us to predict the proper delay that was being introduced off chip. And then we could redesign again the, the transmitter part of the chip so, so that we could delay the, the high-speed uh, bits to be transmitted, and, and then everything worked fine. So the moral is, simulate all of your on-chip and off-chip parasitics, to be sure. Thank you. This is confession number 10, can two wrongs made a right? So in this case, this is about the arbitration circuits for a silicon cochlea. So the problem was there was a wrong reasoning in the silicon cochlea logic signal for asynchronous AER protocol. In a two-dimensional array like this with uh, arbitration in two directions, you first arbitrate in the row direction before you arbitrate in the column direction. So the mistake was that the row arbitrage signal was used instead of the column arbit arbitrage signal for generating the chip request, which is one of the handshaking signals. And this mistake seemed to kill off hope of getting any useful output from the chip. But it turns out there was a second mistake, and the second mistake was the use of the wrong polarity of a kill bit control signal so that the AER requests of all channels are now killed instead of one channel. The solution was to first to add an FPGA delay in the chip acknowledged to take into account the time needed for arbitration in the column direction, but this was not sufficient because uh, we still got deadlock once in a while. And so Turns out that if we activate the kill bit control signal so that the local requests of all channels are killed after receiving the chip request, the deadlock does not happen. Of course, finally, we redesigned the chip to fix the mistakes. So the moral of this is, don't give up hope when encountering the first mistake. Sometimes another mistake can give an approximate right to get chip results for a paper. Okay, so the chip we were designing had quite a few control signals and to generate those signals we used some on-chip logic so that we can use a fewer external signals to, to drive it. And just to make sure that that logic works, we connected some of those signals as test points to the output of the chip so we can monitor them. Now, the chip was not working, and when we started to look at these test signals, something was not behaving right. Eventually, we figured out what happened. We only had abstract views for our paths and we carefully connected them to the internal core signals, but it turned out we used an input path for an output signal. That's obviously pretty bad. Uh, now we thought about blasting the thing with, a, with an ion beam, but eventually we found a better solution. We replicated some of this internal logic of the chip on an external FPGA. We now feeding the test point with the exact same signal as the test point is producing and everything uh, is working this way. So uh, I guess the morals are do a full LVS including IO, uh, generate schematics if you don't have them, uh, but not all hope may be lost and if things are not working before you vaporize the wires, think about uh, building a workaround. This confession is about this bias in circuit is based on the beta multiplier and we added a few branches to generate other voltages that we needed in our chip. This circuit was fabricated in a 0.5 CMOS process. When we got the chips from fabrication we measured them and we found that this voltage was, was within 10% of its expected value. This one was within point, few percentage points 
And however, this voltage was off by 60%, and these voltages were stuck at the ground. We went back to the layout and check again. We found an open circuit on this branch, and a transistor on this branch was of the wrong size. So what happened? How do we make these mistakes? We didn't do all the proper checks, like LVS and post layout simulations, because we were running late and the submission deadline was approaching fast. The moral of this confession is don't cut corners, right? Do all your checks, LVS, pre layout, post layout simulations, and of course, don't wait until the last day to submit your chip design. In 2003, we were designing a Sigma Delta ADC in a cutting edge technology in those times, and some cut tools like a parasitic extraction was not available. The chip was designed and fabricated, and experimental results show a drastic performance degradation compared with simulation, as you can see in the bottom picture in this slide. So, after an exhaustive check in, we note that there was a floating end well in one PMOS transistor of some CMOS switches, which are highlighted in the top picture in this slide. Obviously, this error affected the operation of the chip. And after some discussion in our team, one of our PhD students admitted that she had ignored a warning message related to this because she said that it was just a warning, not an error. So, in the end, we solved this problem and the redesigned chip demonstrated experimental state of the art results. So, the moral are don't underestimate warning messages from CAD tools. And if you are a novel designer, ask your supervisor. And if you are a senior designer, supervise all the work in detail. That's all. Hi, this is Vincent Frick from the University of Strasbourg, France. The title of my confession is. Choosing the wrong capacitor type can make an amplifier useless. A few years ago, we developed a gas sensor based on organic field effect transistors. Unfortunately, we overlooked the process parameters of the MIM capacitor used for Miller compensation in one of the amplifiers. As a result, our amplifier would break down, making the sensor useless. Such a classic. We replaced the MIM capacitor by a high voltage compliant capacitor and voila, problem solved. Always sit down, have a cup of coffee, take a moment to carefully read the process documentation and never ever overlook the warnings in the simulation log file. Hello, my name is Teresa Serrano Torredona. I'm going to present a layout error when, that we made when designing it. Uh, Integrated amplifier neuron for test purposes. We designed the neuron, we did the layout, and we did the proper post layout simulation at the cell level. The idea was to design a chip including many test structures, each one with a separate pattern. But when the circuit came back and we tested the neuron, the integrated fire neuron, it didn't oscillate as expected and it didn't behave as expected. And so we discovered that the problem was that during the route into the paths, we have put two critical lines in parallel and uh, with long parallel lines and very close. So a big parasitic coupling between them was destroying the expected behavior. And this was a last minute. A change that was not post line assimilated. So the solution was obviously to separate the critical lines uh, and then do post layer simulations, uh, send the circuit for fabrication again and test it and was behaving as expected. So the moral is always do full, full post layer simulation, including the paths, and don't do last minute changes without post simulating and doing the parasitic simulation again. Thanks. Hello, my name is Paula Lopez and this is Confession 18 and I'm going to talk about why it's not a good idea to use long and thin metal lines to power low dropout regulators. So the problem we had when measuring an LDO is that we found a load regulation value of about 40 millivolts 
millivolts per milliamp, which was way higher than expected. In fact, it was a factor 2,500 times worse than what the simulation predicted. So what we did then is we had a look at our device and we realized that our device was too far away from the input and output paths and that the meta lines that we were using were too long and too thin. We then did some hand calculations with the documentation provided by the foundry and estimated a resistance of these metal wires of about 50 ohms, which was of course the reason of our problem. So the only solution here was to make thicker lines and refabricate the devices. So the conclusion here is that you have to make sure that your long metal lines are wide enough if you want to do good experimental characterization. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Melissa Papen from Institute of Neuroinformatics and University of Zurich ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And I have a confession along with Edward Matavon from University of Maryland NIST. The title of our confession is that the power grids are important for a reason. When we were doing our PhD together, we were designing a chip with online learning capabilities interfacing with membership devices. And as a result, um, the neurons had to drive the membership devices and change their state ba based on the uh, the state of the neuron. So there was a lot of current passing through the through the chip. Um, but because we were under the stress of the deadline, as you can see on the right in the figure, we did not really do a proper power grid. So the supply wires um, ended up having um, a lot of parasitic resistance, which then ended up uh, causing the power supply to bounce a lot because the, the voltage drop across them was not negligible. So the solution to that is that one has to do a careful analysis of the worst case current draw in the system and then do a proper power grid in the final layout because if you do a proper power grid, then the resistances end up being in parallel with each other. So that these parasitic resistances uh, go lower. And also, the, it's very important to do a thick top metal layer for power grid because that also reduces the resistance. So the moral of the story is that, especially if you have large amount of currents in your design, you have to really pay attention to the power grid and do a proper one. Confession 21 is about how light sneaks through the tiniest cracks or the sun is bright. A typical event sensor output from us should look like this, where black means no events and green and red are the on and off events. But we noticed that whenever we had the sun in the field of view, even if the sun was outside the, the actual field of view of the chip, the sensor would just go wild and create storms of events. The problem was that the sun made our event camera go wild. The solution was that we found the sensitive spot on our chip and covered it with aluminum foil, as I'm going to show now. We set up a laser diode over a microscope. We put the chip under the microscope and focus a little light spot onto the chip. And we just moved that light spot around over the chip using the stage on the microscope until we found this particular spot that corresponded to where we saw, saw the sun was very sensitive. It was a spot inside our on-chip bias generator that made the tiniest currents. Even though the metal is overlapping here, it still wasn't, wasn't thick enough metal to block the sun from getting through the cracks and creating parasitic photocurrent. Finally, the workaround solution before we had um, epoxy dot covering was to cover the edge of the chip with aluminum foil, which effectively blocks all the light from hitting the bias generator here. And so the moral of this is think about what focused sunlight shining onto your silicon might do. Hello everyone, Camilo here. A confession today is about understanding the hardware before you integrate it in your system. The problem we had was uh, with the new robotics platform and Spinnaker. There is a synchronization mechanism built in that ticks every 20 milliseconds and, and synchronizes the neuro simulator and the physics simulation. And this was very bad for the performance of Spinnaker. So the first step in the solution was to recognize that we made design uh, errors while just trying to integrate the Spinnaker as it was on, on our system. And the solution was to use a different mechanism and then change the design and have Spinnaker streaming and running constantly uh, spikes over UDP and then using that in the system. So the moral, uh, first understand the components that you have and what they can and what they can't do. 
and then analyze before starting any integration if you need to redesign something um, in order to make it work properly. Hello everyone, my name is Ian Williams from Imperial College London and the confession I'm sharing with you today is about some test circuits we included on a die. The problem we had was that when we designed the senseback chip, we managed to fit well within our allocated space in the reticle. Colleagues pounced on the opportunity to include some test circuits on the die. However, our system design required that the dies be bonded in a precision moulded package, and we didn't consider the implications that inset bond pads would have on the paths that the bond wires would take, and neither did the company we hired to do the bonding. This resulted in bond wires breaching the top of the moulded package, and it wasn't just a single die, it was a batch of around 30. Fortunately, they hadn't moulded all the dies in a single batch, and so following a system redesign, we were able to accept a glob top style package that allowed for the high bond wires. The morals of the story are that what is on the die can still affect your system, even if it is isolated, and that even engaging expert companies doesn't necessarily present, prevent mistakes, it can even scale them up. Hello, my name is Stephen Carey. I was lead designer on the Scan5 Vision chip. This was made on an MPW run, so we got back about 40 bare die and 10 packaged devices. First test worked out okay, so we wanted to build more systems for our co-workers. So we sent off 10 die to Company 1, who promptly created numerous shorts by smearing huge wedge bonds over not just the bond pad, but also a perimeter ground wire. So moved on and chose Company 2, who packaged up our devices beautifully and then attached a metal lid. They then spent the next five months trying to work out how to remove the metal lid and replace it with a glass lid. So the solution to this debacle is to work is to get some insurance somehow. Buying it's probably too expensive, but you can fly out with your test gear and test as the as the packaging house packages. So the moral to this story is spend a little cash to save yourself time and money. Hi everybody. We have designed a smart image sensor with intensity to time pixels for concurrent focal plane generation of compressed samples. The selection of the pixels is done with the help of a set of random number generator built with zero automaton. All the, the compressed samples uh, are built uh, outside of the array uh, by the asynchronous tagging of events in a per column basis. In this scheme, uh, we are lacking enough uh, test points and uh, an agile row and column multiplexer connections. Therefore, the solution for characterizing the chip has been to employ isolated copies of the of the pixels that are outside of the array and of the some of the blocks in order to do the characterization. But the problem comes when uh, you know the characterization of aggregated phenomena. For that, we had to do painful recursive initialization of the server automaton and repetitive experiments in order to characterize pixels one by one. The models of it is that in bottom-up approaches like this one, it is easy to end with no room for test points. The system becomes so intricate that uh, characterization is really difficult. So the message is plan your testing strategy in advance. Hello everyone, Robert Naraki. Confession number 29. Microfabrication is a manual, lengthy and tedious and very labor intensive process and it requires concentration of every step. One of the issues is that the process is sequential and cumulative, meaning the errors at the end are more costly than at the beginning. So we had this process to fabricate ultra thin film transistors that was using a sacrificial Teflon layer. So it will be relatively easy to remove um, this transistor stack, this film stack. And one time when I was really tired, because I was working a couple of days back to back, 10 hours a day, and I was in a hurry because I was supposed to meet some friends for lunch, and someone texted me, and I lost the concentration for just maybe one second, and I brought a nitrogen gun used to clean the surface too close to the edge. And right here at the edge of the 
of the film, I ended up delaminating the whole film and effectively destroying it. So the moral is, uh, in terms of micro microfabrication, first of all, don't let yourself lose focus and don't rush. It's better to come back the next day to finish whatever you were doing as opposed to losing everything. And in microfabrication, it's not a programming. There is no backspace or control. Our paper includes a helpful checklist, which is categorized by different color depending on the type of possible problem, which we hope can help prevent problems in some of your future projects. So gather your mistakes for the next confession session. We don't know when it's gonna be, but we know it's gonna happen someday. On behalf of all the authors and editors of our confession session paper, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>